Just outside the eastern rampart of Landell, past the inner wall, amidst the ash-covered remnants of the rampart, a striking scene is unfolding, and one that, while initially easy to overlook, one scene is impossible to forget. Here, a collection of misbegotten, until this point in the story only framed as repulsive and pitiful pariahs who were subjugated by the current order, and who are most notably seen in Castle Morn, hacking their former masters limb from limb, are seen here doing something we've never seen them do before. They're praying. A group are found praying to a set of graves, with a perfumer overlooking the scene. Some appear to be crying or praying to the perfumer itself, and most provocative of all, a single scaly misbegotten is seen praying to a saint statue. This is one of the most evocative and, frankly, startling scenes in the whole game. Not for its bombast, but for its understated intrigue. Who are the misbegotten mourning? Why here? And, most importantly of all, why would they pray to a saint statue? The answers to these questions will completely change how you see these forsaken creatures, their role in the greater story, and the central narrative of Elden Ring. Let's start by briefly reviewing what the game tells us explicitly about the Misbegotten. The winged Misbegotten Ashes tell us, quote, the Misbegotten are held to be a punishment for making contact with the Crucible, and from birth, they are treated as slaves, or worse, end quote. This text establishes that misbegotten are born this way, not transformed, consistent with the meaning of their name. Misbegotten, meaning they were sired or conceived incorrectly. So already we have a hint that there is something interesting about their heritage, or at least how they were produced. We know from Perfumer Tricia's ashes that they are considered impure, like the omen, and that at least some perfumers tried to purify them, which helps to explain the presence of the perfumers in that opening scene outside of Landell's rampart. The Crucible Scale Feather and Knot talismans all read, quote, A vestige of the Crucible of Primordial Life. Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity, as civilization has advanced." End quote. These descriptions are quite informative for a few reasons. For one, the game makes it clear that these features used to be considered divine, but are now considered impure, indicating there was a time during which the crucible was revered, a fact further attested to by the mere existence of the Crucible Knights, who, by the way, seem at least partially allied with the Misbegotten. Second, one of these vestiges is called a knot. Unlike the other parts that appear in animals, knots don't. They do, however, appear on trees. Keep that in mind because we'll return to this point later on in the video. For now, let's just point out that many of these so-called vestigial features of the Crucible are actually draconic in nature. The Misbegotten have dragon scales, dragon tails, and even wings. The Misbegotten are chimeric creatures, in fact visually inspired by hybrid taxidermy, the so-called art of combining different animals into a stuffed, mixed chimera. The practice became historically prominent in the Age of Exploration, when expeditions were charged with bringing back evidence of exotic new species. As it turns out, some of the more sensational claims of discovery were in fact the creative designs of the taxidermists themselves, rather than of runaway Darwinian isolation. The misbegotten appear as just that, with mixed appendages of human, draconic, and bestial elements. While the different flavors, or species, if you would, of Misbegotten are each informative as to the details of their own deep lore, and perhaps actually reflect individual specific creation events, we will focus today on the Misbegotten as a group, rather than on the individual subtypes. In that regard, we should appreciate that they are chimeras with appendages from different species, that they present with aspects of the Crucible, 
and that those named aspects of the crucible correspond to draconic body parts and tree nuts. Fair enough so far. But to dive in further and uncover the real story of the misbegotten, we need to untangle some of the metaphorical specifics through their real-world illusions. And for that, we need to draw on, once again, how tree biology and arboreal practices are used as literalized metaphors of lineage and birth in this land of magical sacred trees. We've previously invoked crown sprouting and copsing, clonal sprouting and serotony, all phenomena linked to tree life cycles and forest management. In this episode, we will invoke one more, a pretty significant one that will not surprise you. To understand the misbegotten and the other creatures that display features of Elden Ring's deep past, we need to talk about grafting. Plant grafting is a technique whereby the connective tissue and circulatory system of one plant is merged with that of another plant, thereby creating a sort of hybrid entity. The upper, new part is typically called the scion, while the plant onto which the scion is grafted is called the rootstock. This can be done with the same species, of course, but is often done to combine a scion selected on the basis of its fruit production and a rootstock selected for its hardy roots. A typical example of this would be the production of citrus. All commercially farmed citrus fruit, from pomelos to limes and everything in between, come from chimeric trees, where the fruit-bearing part of the tree is a different species from the rootstock, like a delicious lemon tree grafted onto an unpalatable but hardy Japanese bitter orange tree. This produces a fusion of body parts into chimera that gives advantageous aspects of specific appendages from different species. Of course, in Elden Ring, there are abundant allusions to grafting, most notably Godric the Grafted and his grafted scions. But the role of grafting in Elden Ring's story goes far beyond these superficial allusions. You see, as we've elaborated on extensively in our Cycle of Life trilogy, in Elden Ring trees are not merely metaphorical constructs for lineage and descent, but are literally the conduits through which genetic propagation occurs. People are born through the Erd tree and are recycled back to its roots when they die. So grafting, the addition of a foreign and genetically distinct scion, to an existing lineage is quite a useful construct to imagine the competing lineages for power in Elden Ring. To take just one example, the Golden Lineage, Godfrey and his offspring, is just one branch of the Grand Genealogy Tree of Elden Ring. Grafting, then, to fuse the arboreal and genealogical metaphors, would be the co-opting of the old genealogical lineage and infusing it with new genetics. So now the question is, what is grafted onto what? What's the scion and what's the rootstock? As it happens, you probably already know about the rootstock of Elden Ring's world. Like we've mentioned previously, and is quite apparent when exploring the vast catacomb system in-game, the root system of the Lands Between is far more extensive and ancient than the Erd Tree, which is merely the latest incarnation of a sacred tree though we'll return to the specific case of the Erdtree in a moment. This root system stretches from the northernmost tip of the mountaintops to the southernmost tip of the Weeping Peninsula, and is, we are told, one giant contiguous root system. Here is the rootstock of the Lands Between. What's odd about this ancient rootstock of the Lands Between, which is so ancient and so vast, it is essentially the foundation of this world, is that it apparently used to produce, well, coniferous trees. All of the dead spectral trees in the mountaintops of the giants are coniferous, seemingly all destroyed by some great catastrophe, like a great forest fire, and the resulting new growth shrubbery is just setting in. In the Altus Plateau, there are only two types of trees, the older conifers, many of them withering and sickly, 
juxtapose with the brilliantly autumnal deciduous trees. And most suggestively of all, the old reliefs of what we've called the Great Tree clearly shows a conifer, inspired by the ancient Norway spruce known as Old Jiko. Whereas the Earth Tree relief is clearly deciduous. So the rootstock used to produce conifers, but now the dominant form is that of an angiosperm, a deciduous tree. Actually, not just any deciduous tree. The Erd tree and its progeny, including the minor Erd trees and the new growth on the Altus Plateau, are quite specifically beech trees. The leaves of the Erd tree match quite nicely with the leaves of a beech tree. The seeds of the Erd tree even bear a passing resemblance to the seeds of a beech. Beech trees, like the Erd tree, produce precious sap, which is boiled down into syrup. Beech trees are quite effectively copsed as they exhibit robust root sprouting. And most importantly of all, beech trees are the prototypical tree for carving remembrances into because of their distinctive bark and predictable scars. The Erd tree, the tree of memories that stores the remembrances of the bosses we collect in game, is a beech. The remembrances of mighty warriors literally hewn into its trunk like the memories of so many teenage friends and lovers in our own world. In fact, the association between writing and beech trees in Norse and Germanic cultures is so tight that the word book actually derives from the word for beech tree. The question that arises from this observation is, how can you have roots that used to produce conifers but now produce deciduous, specifically beech trees? Well, the straightforward answer is grafting. It is quite literally the process of growing one species onto the roots of a different species. Of course, grafting between coniferous and deciduous trees is not possible in real life. They are too far apart phylogenetically. But when you're talking about magical golden trees, it's not so great a leap. The emerging story here is that the Erd tree was grafted onto a pre-existing vast rootstock, the roots of the lands between. And interestingly enough, the Elden Ring seen in Furumazula during the reign of Dragonlord Placidusax actually shows an extensive root system, indicating that the rootstock was already of paramount importance during the Age of the Dragons. It's no huge leap to imagine that the Furumazula Elden Ring and its life-giving powers were used to actually produce dragons and beasts during this era, in the same way that the current Elden Ring and the Erd Tree are used to produce people in this era. If that statement is confusing to you, we'd recommend watching our Cycle of Life trilogy, but the TLDR version is that the Erd Tree literally produces people. And if the Erd Tree produces people through the power of the Elden Ring, it's fair to postulate that the dragon version of the Elden Ring produced, well, dragons back in their heyday. This helps to explain why Godric refers to the slain dragon he grafts onto himself during his phase two transition as a, quote, trueborn heir, end quote. Mighty dragon, there the true born Air. likely referring to the fact that dragons come from the original rootstock. This rootstock, which sprouted coniferous trees like the Great Tree Relief, was at one point used to produce dragons. In fact, a neat little potential artistic inspiration for this process may come from the process of making so-called dragon eggs by sanding down pine cones an art form that has influenced our collective image of a dragon egg and its pop culture depictions, for example, in George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. 
Serotonous pine cones, which need intense heat to open and release their seeds, undoubtedly will remind some viewers of Danny's dragon eggs, which only hatch in the presence of a great conflagration. And just to tidy this connection between ancient conifers and dragons, just as dragons, which are basically dinosaurs, are the far more ancient animal form compared to mammals, so too are gymnosperms, the group including conifers, the far more ancient type of tree, evolving hundreds of millions of years before angiosperms like the beech tree. So an ancient coniferous rootstock during the age of dragons is quite spot on, actually. So with that conceptual framework in mind, let's return to the story of the misbegotten. As we've said, they are chimeras, but not chimeras with just any random assortment of features, but rather they have a combination of human, bestial, and draconic features. In horticulture, this is simply known as a graft hybrid or graft chimera, and produces plants with features mixed and matched between the two species. This mixture of two discrete genetic lineages is exactly what can be seen in grafting, and it would seem to indicate that the misbegotten were born from a sacred tree in an era during which there were both human and draconic lineages. And as it happens, we know exactly what this period was in the lands between. It was the Crucible Era. As we've described previously, the Crucible is quite specifically the period of multiple sprouts from a preserved root system after the trunk has been destroyed. If you'll recall, that is why the only known references to the form of the Crucible are to a tree, but the form shown in the Crucible Helm in Silurius Spear is not just any tree, but the very specific phase of crown sprouting. Each of these sprouts represents a lineage, and creatures born from this period in the lands between would have chimeric features, because its lineages are not clearly delineated as they would be in later periods. So now we know why there are all of these connections between the misbegotten and the crucible. The residual draconic genetics of this rootstock explain why, during the age of the crucible and its numerous competing sprouts from the rootstock, there would be chimeric, half-human, half-dragon beings born. The crucible was the chaotic transition period between the original rootstock, which produced dragons, and the grafted erd tree, which produced humans. From this perspective, aspects of the crucible, that is, wings, feathers, horns, scales, etc., are all aspects of the rootstock. As we mentioned before, there is even a crucible knot talisman, a pretty explicit reference to tree knots, which form when branches are pruned or die otherwise, and the surrounding tissue grows around the base of the former branch. Of course, the crucible era, like all else, was fleeting, and the refinement of this period of multiplicity into a single golden lineage is what is shown in what we have called the Crucible Statues, which line the Grand Imperial Road, are found within the capital city, and even the Round Table Hold. A specific subtype of grafting, called bud grafting, requires pruning of the rootstock branches after the scion has been successfully grafted. Those are suckers. Here I pinch them off. It's important to remove these suckers from the rootstock as they could eventually take over and crowd out the grafted variety if left alone. So it's no surprise that these statues show the tending of one scion from a crown sprouting rootstock, a scion that is shown in its sister statues alone, after pruning all of the other shoots, to facilitate the growth of the golden scion. This statue is a depiction of grafting, specifically of the golden erd tree onto a pre-existing rootstock, one that was associated with more draconic features than human and ultimately the pruning of all of those non-erd tree branches to leave a single golden scion. The vast human corpus of grafting techniques includes a variety of ways in which to foster grafted scion growth while suppressing the endogenous features of the rootstock. Medieval manuscripts lay out these processes and the use of a variety of tools to facilitate this process. Invariably, grafting is achieved by fostering rootstock health while suppressing the growth of its own shoots. 
In plant physiology, competition between sprouting branches is quite explicit and happens through plant hormones that are secreted from the tips of growing branches. As these hormones travel down the vasculature of the tree, they actually inhibit growth of other branches. This is the reason why pruning the tips of branches stimulates growth in other parts of the tree. Pruning removes the suppression, called apical inhibition, exerted by the robustly growing branches. These same principles are applied, of course, in grafting. While the rootstock is usually hardier and would often outcompete the grafted scion, because humans want the scion to grow and produce the specific lineage of the graft rather than the rootstock, tenders will prune rootstock shoots to promote the growth of the grafted scion. Likewise, an excellent substrate for grafting is right after a tree has been felled, all apical inhibition fully removed, and the stump, disinhibited while still having a healthy root system, sprouts out in a flurry of new growth, known as crown sprouting. All shoots being disinhibited is the perfect environment for grafting, and this is exactly what happened in the magical world of Elden Ring. After the felling of the great tree comes the age of the crucible, a flurry of new growth around the great tree's remaining roots and stump. Echoes of this may be found in a double entendre of the old fang description, which reads, quote, These multiple overlapping fangs grow from a single root. Perhaps they are a vestige of the primordial crucible. End quote. During this age, the golden scion is grafted onto the crucible, creating a graft chimera containing both draconic rootstock shoots and the grafted golden shoot. As this graft integrates, the shoots of that rootstock, as in real grafting, were removed, thus giving the golden scion the full benefits of nourishment from the rootstock without any growth inhibition from its competing branches. To reiterate, this is the process we are shown in the crucible statues. It is the essence of the crucible, the primordial form of the Erd tree a grand grafted beech tree onto a vast coniferous root system. Echoes of metaphors of cruelty of different peoples in the corpus of human history are clear in this story, and in a way beautifully conveyed through the subtle yet powerful metaphor of trees. But grafted trees do not persist in perpetuity and neither did the Erd tree. Not only does the initial grafting phase require the selective pruning of the undesirable branches, those that display elements of the original rootstock, but because the rootstock is a stable feature of the chimera, in time a grafted tree will produce sprouts from the original rootstock, known usually as root suckers. This is how you can get the seemingly counterintuitive scenario with a grafted citrus tree that is growing thorny sprouts with misshapen leaves from its base, literally a different species growing from beneath the graft. These root suckers, which display the features of the original rootstock, not the grafted scion, are considered omens of ill health of the plant, because it is an indication that the apical dominance of the grafted scion is waning, its growth is stunted, and with a bit of poetic license, its age is ending. If allowed to flourish, root suckers will sap the nutrients from the graft, causing the fruit to suffer, and ultimately replace the overground growth of the tree with the original species. Some of you will by now know where we're going with this. The omens of Elden Ring, artistically inspired by a real human condition known as a cutaneous horn, display features of the original draconic rootstock, like horns and tails, and they are literally omens of ill health of the grafted Erd tree. They signify that the tree is not healthy, and they are the organism's attempt to produce new branches from its rootstock. The emergence of omens in the world of Elden Ring would no doubt have been met with scorn and disgust, not just because of their physical appearance, but because they are undeniable evidence that the Erd tree's age of plenty was ending. Once the omen appeared, the end was clearly nigh. Though these unwanted root suckers may be pruned at first, at some point the health of the tree is unsalvageable. Indeed, the common attempt to quote unquote 
cure, omenhood, simply cutting off the cutaneous horns, is akin to clipping the thorns from unwanted root suckers, a superficial but ultimately futile solution. And just to come full circle on this channel's arboreal musings, a typical way to solve the problem of root suckers, if you can't pull them out individually, would be to cut or burn down the whole tree, and to start the process all over again. Take it back to the crucible stage and regraft. And as it happens, that is exactly the plan that some within the Golden Order had. So, to summarize what we've discussed so far, the Furumazula Elden Ring displays the Draconic rootstock, which is associated with the Coniferous Great Tree. Outside of Furumazula during this period, the Great Tree reliefs and saint statues are the predominant iconographic features. At some point, the new Elden Ring, the one that represents the Erd Tree, is grafted onto the rootstock. This is followed by a period of multiplicity known as the Crucible, during which there are sprouts from both the original rootstock as well as the grafted scion, the Erd Tree. But this period of multiplicity was ended by the pruning of the other sprouts, leaving only the single golden Erd Tree, and its life-giving power was then harnessed to produce a new type of creature, the golden-haired people of the golden lineage with none of the draconic features that marked the prior age. Following this, there was, of course, a brief period of abundance, the Erd Tree's Age of Plenty. That era's wane was heralded by the sudden emergence of the omens, anthropomorphized rootsuckers that displayed features of the original rootstock, and were thus detested by the Erd Tree faithful. That even the royal couple, Godfrey and Merica, could produce omens is evidence that no one could escape the consequences of the Erd Tree's waning vitality. With this in mind, we may answer the question at the outset of the video. No wonder, then, that the misbegotten outside Langdell are seen praying to a saint statue. The misbegotten are vestiges of the prior rootstock order, represented by the saint and tree iconography. Likewise, it is no coincidence that the royal omen of the subterranean shunning grounds are found praying to the Chthonic Libation Statue, which, as we've discussed in prior videos, is also a vestige of the prior pre-Erd Tree Age. The omens in the Misbegotten, though born in different eras, each display features of the original rootstock, and they long for the era, the Great Tree Era and its saints, when they were still seen as having touched the divine. So, how would these misbegotten feel when they learned of the plot to produce a new sacred tree, the Halic tree, one that is not just far away, but is completely separate from the pre-existing rootstock? The scene unfolding at the Halic tree gives us our answer, with the misbegotten invaders having attacked the Halic tree town and murdered most of its inhabitants. This may seem like just a redux of the Castle Morn situation, a servant class rebellion, but in reality this appears to be an invasion. That's why we see something called a misbegotten crusader in the consecrated snowfields, just outside the Halic tree. While this may appear to be a mere rebellion, it may actually be a religious crusade. As we've described before, the Halic tree's entire point is to be removed from the contaminants of the existing rootstock, once that rootstock had been irrevocably corrupted by Godwin's death root. Mikola dreamed of mercy killing his beloved half-brother and starting a new age, far away from Langdell and, most importantly, not connected to the corrupted roots. Mikola's fresh start was ambitious and even, perhaps, noble. But the misbegotten products of the prior rootstock would definitely not agree. Likewise, Moog, also contaminated by the ancient rootstock, seeks to divert the amniotic life-giving power infused by Mikola to create a new root system for the creation of an irredentist draconic rootstock dynasty. Vestiges of lineage and power are not so easily cleansed. 